Uh, we've done three rules here right now, three hand rules that relate to the relationship between electricity and magnetism. The first hand rule, which we just essentially had our quiz on, was the wire grasp rule. The wire grasp rule is simply used to find the direction of the magnetic field produced by a moving charge. Okay, you've got a moving charge, whether it's in a wire or not, it's going to generate a magnetic field. That magnetic field will be circular, and we can find the direction of that magnetic field by the wire grasp rule. In this case, we've got our electrons moving into the page. That circular magnetic field surrounding that moving charge. We're going to use our left hand, thumb in the direction of the particle, fingers in the direction of the field. It's going to go counterclockwise. So wire grasp rule tells us that the magnetic field that's caused by that moving charge is a counterclockwise, from this frame of reference, a counterclockwise magnetic field. The second rule was the coil rule, or the solenoid rule, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, it's used to find the magnetic field as well caused by moving charges, but it's a little bit more specific. Okay, the first rule is applicable whenever you have a wire in any shape, in any orientation, find the magnetic field caused by that. This second one is specific to a wire that's wrapped around in a coil. In other words, it's a... Uh, Starts with an S. What's the other word? A solenoid, right. Let's say we got a current that goes, uh, which end is the negative end, which end is the positive? Negative is the smaller one, this end is positive. So the electric current is going to go this way. Let's say we got an electric current going clockwise here. We want to find the direction of the magnetic field and therefore the polarity of this electromagnet. This time we're going to do the exact opposite process that we did with number one, the wire grasp rule. We're going to stick our fingers in the direction of the current, which if we roll up our piece of paper to make it into our coil here, okay, our fingers are going to go up in the front. Yesterday afternoon when we were going over this with the other class, they had a lot of trouble with front and back. So this is what I told them to do. I said, take your coil, and if you struggle with that as well, I didn't anticipate that to be honest, and I'm not sure if any of you struggled with that. Okay, but if, I mean, it sounds silly, right? You're struggling with front and back, but um, people were looking at their, their, their paper, their coil here, and it's like, you know, putting their hands and the fingers in the wrong directions, and okay, they, were, they were looking at this side, but they were thinking this was the front, because that's what I was looking at, and whatever. What I told them to do, if you struggle with this, do the exact same thing as I told them to do yesterday. Take your coil, and it sounds silly, but it works. Write the word front on it. Write the word front. And then look at it. That's the front. When you're looking at the word front, that's the front. Okay? Stick your fingers on the word front. Okay, this time they're going to be up in the front. So literally, stick your fingers on the word front, up in the front. Which way does your thumb point? Points to the right. So what's the polarity of this? If the magnetic field points towards the right, the polarity of this is south-north, right? The left hand is south. Left-hand side is south, and the right-hand side is north. If we continued the magnetic field around here, it would go from north to south outside of this electromagnet, or from south to north inside of the electromagnet. All right, the third rule we had, and this is the one that we took a look at yesterday for the first time, is the hand rule for deflection. The left-hand rule for negative particles, or the right-hand rule for positive particles. This is a different kind of rule. This is not just finding a magnetic field caused by a moving charge. Both of the first two were. Different scenarios, okay, different orientations of wires and so on, but still fundamentally doing the same thing. What's the direction of the magnetic field caused by moving charges through a wire? Okay, this one is different. With the hand rule for deflection, we're trying to find not a direction of a field. We usually already have that in this case. We're trying to find the direction of a force. So the first two rules don't involve a force at all. The third rule does. There's your first clue. You ever wondering which rule to use? If you're trying to find a force or a deflection, it's going to be the third rule. The second thing is you've got to have an external magnetic field here. So maybe it's caused by magnets. Maybe it's caused by the Earth. It doesn't matter. You've got a magnetic field that's independent of the moving charge. But you've also got a moving charge, which produces its own magnetic field. So in this case, I've got an electron moving out of the page. It makes a magnetic field that's going to look like this. A clockwise magnetic field. There's also a magnetic field there caused by these magnets pointing from north to south. 
those two magnetic fields will interact with each other. Now, if we look at that diagram the way that it's drawn right now, it would be incredibly complicated a process to try to figure out which way the force is. That's why we have this little rule, the hand rule for deflection. It goes like this. Stick your left thumb if it's a negative particle, your right thumb if it's positive, in the direction of the moving charge. That's the same as the first rule. Okay, thumb goes out of the page in this case. Here's where it differs. My fingers aren't going to be clenched this time. Okay, so for the first time, I'm going to straighten out my fingers. I want my fingers and my thumb to be about 90 degrees to each other. Okay, thumb points in the direction of the particle, which is out of the page. Fingers point in the direction, not of the field that was caused by the moving charge, but rather the external magnetic field, which in this case is to the right, from north to south. So thumb out of the page, fingers to the right, your palm will automatically point in the direction of the force, which is in this case, down the page, toward the bottom of the page. Does that make sense? Hey, let's try a couple more quick examples of this one here, guys. Everybody take out your left and your right hand and get ready to go here. We've got a negative particle going towards the back of the room. We have a magnetic field caused by whatever, not by the particle, but caused by something else that's pointing towards the ceiling. What's the direction of the force? Towards the window. Thumb towards the back of the room, fingers toward the ceiling, palm points toward the window, towards the right side of the room. All right, we've got a positive particle going towards the left side of the room. Positive particle towards the left side of the room. We've got a magnetic field that points downward towards the floor. Which way is the magnetic force? Towards the back wall, right. Thumb, fingers, palm points toward the back wall. One more. We've got a positive particle, okay, a positive particle that's going towards the back of the room. We've got a magnetic force that's pointing towards the ceiling, okay? We've got a magnetic force that's pointing towards the ceiling. Okay, which way is the field? Okay, We're kind of doing algebra on it this time, right? Rearranging the hand rule for deflection. Instead of thumb, fingers, which way does your palm point? It's thumb, palm, which way do your fingers point? Particle is moving towards the back of the room. The force was toward the ceiling. Thumb, palm points up towards the ceiling. Fingers point which way? Fingers point towards the window, right? So the magnetic field in that case would be towards the window. Does that make sense, guys? Along with this hand rule for deflection, we also introduced an equation that describes the value of the force, the magnitude of the force. So we can find the direction by using the hand rule for deflection. We can find the magnitude of the force by using this equation, F is equal to QVB. Um, a couple quick questions here, guys. First of all, what's that little upside down T there? means perpendicular. This equation, and for that matter, the hand rule that we just did, are only valid if the charged particle is moving perpendicular to the field, 90 degrees to the field, like this. Okay, if they're not perpendicular, you either won't have to do the question or they'll be parallel. If they're parallel, what's the value of the force? Zero. So we don't have to do a hand rule there, right? If one particle is moving this way, the field is this way, the force is zero. Particles this way, the field is this way, still parallel, but opposite in direction, the force is still zero. If they're like this, then the force is QVB. If they're like this, then you don't have to do that question. Okay, you're not going to encounter that in physics 30. All right? Um, second question here. What are these uh, vertical lines that we have around F and B? We've seen those before, right? Absolute value. So what we're saying is when we calculate this force, it is a vector. There is a direction with it, but this equation won't give me the direction. Does that make sense? The equation doesn't tell me what the direction is. I have to find the direction some other way, and that's going to be with the hand rule for deflection. Okay? And we worked on a couple of questions here yesterday, um, two sets of, of questions. Uh, and what I left you with yesterday was uh, page 600, question number 1 and 2A. Do we have any issues with 1 and 2A here? Both of them are good? Yeah, all right. I want to spend a few minutes then, just so that we can make sure you're, you're good with this before we move on here. I want to spend a few minutes uh, working on worksheet number 11, probably about 10 minutes, just doing a few questions on worksheet number 11, okay? Let's take that out, and if you have any issues with it, put up your hand and uh, call me over.
and then we'll move on to the next thing, which is kind of an extension of what we're working on here right now. All right, uh, let's have a look now at uh, one multiple choice question, number 72, please. Okay, This is one that typically gives people a little bit of a tough time. So let's everybody just drop these two if you're still working on their worksheet. Just stop working on it, finish it up for homework. Take a look at multiple choice number 72, please. Can you submit that, please, to me as multiple choice number one? All right, everyone, we've got 76% uh, uh, of you chose option A, 6% chose B, 12% chose C, and 6 chose B. So that's the majority of you chose option A. Let's see if that's correct. Let's hope that it is. It says moving electrons can be deflected by electric fields, gravitational fields, and magnetic fields. One electron is allowed to enter each type of field as shown below. We want to know if the, the electron is deflected downward in each case, the electron is deflected downward, what kind of field is it? So in other words, in diagram one, diagram two, and diagram three, the electron moves downwards. We've got three fields all pointing in different directions. What field must it be if the field points in that particular direction and causes that electron to go downward? I'll tell you what one I looked at first, gravity. You know why I looked at gravity? Because it's the easiest one. Gravity is the easiest one because if something has mass, it will be deflected in the direction of that field, right? We drop something, drop a pen, it never goes up. It always goes down as a result of gravity. So if we want this electron to be deflected downward as a result of a gravitational field, we need the gravitational field to point which way? Downward. So which one must be gravity then? Field three must be gravitational field. Right? Right, Randy? All right, the next one that I looked at, funny enough, we're looking at magnetism right now, but the next one I looked at was the electric field, because I think that's the next easiest one. I think the magnetic field is the hardest one, because everything's perpendicular with that. In the electric field, we have two possibilities here. Gravity's easiest because the, the particle always moves in the direction, or is always deflected in the direction of the field. With electricity, it can go with the field or against the field. If it's a positive particle, it goes with the field. If it's a negative, it goes against the field. So if we want an electric field to cause a negative particle to go downward, then we need that, need that electric field to point which way? Upward, right? We need the field to point opposite to the way that we want the particle to go. If this was a proton, we'd need the field to point in the same direction as we want the particle to go. Okay, so which one's the electric field? Option one, right? Now, that must mean that the second one is the magnetic field then, but let's just double check it just to make sure. Okay, if we've got an electron moving to the right, we've got a magnetic field, let's assume that's a magnetic field going into the page, let's see if that does cause a magnetic force downwards on that particle. Thumb to the right, fingers into the page, palm points <coughs> downwards. So sure enough, this is a magnetic field. So now let's look at which one works here. Um, the electron is deflected downward in each field, and field one, two, and three are respectively electric, magnetic, and gravitational. So 76% of you were correct. Okay, the other 24% of you uh, made a mistake on that. Good? All right. I'm going to draw a little picture here of a magnetic field as represented by these X's. That means that magnetic field would be pointing which way? into the page. Okay, we used the X here the other day to represent electrons or protons or alpha particles going into the page. Okay, there's no reason why it has to be a particle. The X is not a chunk of matter. The X is a direction, just like an arrow is. Okay, if we can represent the motion of a particle by an arrow to the right, and we can represent a magnetic field to the right by an arrow to the right, then there's no reason why we can't represent both with X's as well. So in this case, we have a magnetic field pointing into the page. We've got a negative particle. It's moving towards the right side of the page. There is a magnetic force on that particle because it makes its own magnetic field, but yet there's already an external magnetic field there. Let's figure out what direction the force is on that particle. We'd say thumb in the direction of the particle, fingers in the direction of the field, which is into the page, palm points which way? Downward, toward the bottom of the page. So my magnetic force 
will be downward toward the bottom of the page. I'm going to write a little key over here. Okay, my my the velocity of the particle is going to be represented by blue, and the magnetic force on the particle is going to be represented by m. The reason I want a little key is because I'm going to do this a few times. What happens to this particle if it's moving to the right, but yet experiences a force downwards toward the bottom of the page? It's going to go somewhere in between, right? So the particle is now going to be over here somewhere, moving this way, right? Let's try this again. Thumb in the direction of the particle, which is now diagonal down into the right. Fingers field, palm points down into the left. So the magnetic force will be this way. Now where does the particle go? It goes downwards. Thumb in the direction of the particle, fingers in the direction of the field, palm points to the left. Right? Palm points to the left side of the page. Okay, we can keep going on with that. Now the particle's going this way. Thumb in the direction of the particle, fingers in the direction of the field, palm points up and to the left. What do you notice, first of all, about the shape of the path of this particle? It looks like it's going in a circle, doesn't it? It looks like it's going like this. At least as long as it's in the magnetic field. When it comes out of the magnetic field on the other side, it's going to keep going straight, right? Because there's nothing to deflect it anymore. But as long as it's in the magnetic field, it appears to be going in a circle. What do you notice about the magnetic force? That red magnetic force? It's, it's in the same direction? I know what you're saying there. Yeah, it's going to the same point, right? It's pointing to the same place. And what is that place? The middle of the circle. What kind of force points toward the center of a circle. The centripetal force. So what we're saying here now, guys, is that there's a magnetic force, a magnetic force that's represented by the red arrows, but that magnetic force causes the centripetal force. In physics 20, you guys learned that the centripetal force always acts when an object is going in a circle. But it's not a fundamental force. It's always caused by something else. When a car goes around a turn, there's a centripetal force. That centripetal force is caused by friction. Okay, when the Earth goes around the Sun, there's a centripetal force, but that centripetal force is caused by gravity. When an electron goes around the nucleus, there's a centripetal force, but it's caused by an electric force. When the keys go around my head like this, there's a centripetal force, but it's caused by tension in the string. So centripetal force is always caused by something. Okay, it's never a force on its own. Here, the centripetal force is caused by the magnetic force. That allows me, when I'm analyzing a problem involving a charged particle in a magnetic field, to always, if I want to, use this equation, the equation that we learned yesterday, F is equal to QVB. But it also allows me to use this equation. Because the charged particle is moving in a circle and it experiences a centripetal force. But because the centripetal force really is just the magnetic force, it also allows me to set those two forces equal to each other. Centripetal force equal to the magnetic force. Now, all the problems you've done so far involving charged particles in magnetic fields, you've used F is equal to QVB. That's still valid. We're not throwing that out. Okay, that's still perfectly valid. Any problem that you've solved thus far you've, and gotten the correct answer, that's, that's still the correct answer. We're just saying now we have one more tool in the toolbox. Okay? If you're working on a problem involving a charged particle in a magnetic field and QVB won't get you the answer for whatever reason, you have too many unknowns or whatever, then you can also use the centripetal force equation because the charged particle is moving in a circle. And it always is, including the questions you've already done. It's been moving in a circle. You just didn't know that when you were working on these questions before because you didn't need to know it. Okay, now in some of the questions, you still won't need to know it. But in some of the questions, you will. Tenor? Uh, it not be moving perpendicular? No, it's still moving perpendicular, absolutely. That's a good question, though, Tanner. Um, it's still moving perpendicular because the magnetic field, okay, the charged particle, we've got moving along the plane of the page, right, this way, this way, this way, this way. But the magnetic field is always into the page. So if the magnetic field is into the page, okay, 
and the charged particle is going this way, they're perpendicular. Okay, if it's going this way, they're still perpendicular to each other, right? Hey, that's still a perpendicular angle. Does that make sense? Okay, that's a good observation, though. It's not quite right, but it's a good, it's a good observation. Um, we always want to be thinking about things like that, right? Okay, does this work because maybe they're not perpendicular anymore? They are, but we still want to be thinking about that. So, when you get a question now involving a charged particle in a magnetic field, I want you to um, think about the concept, right? Charged particle in a magnetic field. Okay. But I want you to think now, okay, I got three things I can do, not just one. I got this, I've got this, and I've got the combination of them. Does that make sense? Now, one thing that I want to point out here, this equation is on your data sheet. Right? If you don't know where it is, have a look for it. Please try right now to find this equation on your data sheet. F is equal to mv squared over r on your data sheet. Try to find that. It isn't there. It isn't there. Here's what is there. You've got to kind of derive it, although thankfully it's a pretty easy one to derive. On your data sheet, you will see a is equal to v squared over r. That's centripetal acceleration, not centripetal force. But that's close. You're also going to say e, see a is equal to f over m. That's Newton's second law, right? A is, F is equal to m times a. If you combine those two, F over m is equal to v squared over r. So a is equal to a. F over m is equal to v squared over r. Then F becomes mv squared over r. So that's what we've got to do unless you just remember that equation. Combine those two equations. Combine this one. Okay, centripetal acceleration and just general acceleration from Newton's second law to get F is equal to mv squared over r. Does that make sense? Just a word of caution. I don't know how many people, I don't know how many people I've seen do this. Two different things with this equation. Because it's not on your data sheet, people try to remember it and they remember it wrong. Here's the way that people will often remember this equation, f is equal to mv squared over r. Some people will say f is equal to mv squared over r squared. Okay? It's wrong. Okay? Why? Dallin's joking, it's a classic mix-up. Why is it a classic mix-up? Why do people make that mistake? f is equal to kq1, q2 over r squared. e is equal to kq over r squared. There's a lot of r squared on the bottoms, right? Okay, so we got to be careful. It's not r squared this time. It's mv squared over r. The other mistake that people will make, and this is a little bit less common, but I've seen it still lots. Might sound silly, but f is equal to 1 half mv squared over r. What are you mixing up there? Kinetic energy with it, right? Okay, we just, like, they, they, even though they're completely different things, and we know that, they kind of sound a little bit the same, right? mv squared over r, 1 half mv squared, we start mixing them up, okay? And at some level, if we take a step back, we know that's not right. But when you're in the middle of a test and, you know, you've got three minutes left and two questions left and you're, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm not going to finish, I'm not going to finish, okay, that's when we make those mistakes. That's when we miss those little things like that, those silly things, okay? Okay, I got one question to do with you here, and then that's going to be it for the day. Unfortunately, you're going to have to copy out not only the solution to this one, but the question as well, because uh, this one doesn't come from your textbook. This one says an electron is moving with a speed of 4 times 10 to the 5 meters per second, which is a pretty typical speed for a moving charge, to the right through a magnetic field at magnitude 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2 Tesla directed into the page. So I've got a charged particle moving through a magnetic field. If this was yesterday, you would have automatically started thinking F is equal to QVB. Now, it's not yesterday, it's today. We can still automatically think that, but we also have to start thinking F is equal to mv squared over R 
and FC is equal to FM. We don't know which one we're going to use here yet. We want to find the radius of the path of the electron and in which direction it will bend. So let's get this first, the radius of the path. Okay, this is going to be V. Okay, this is going to be B. Okay, we know that the particles moving to the right, the magnetic field is into the page. They're perpendicular to each other, so everything we've learned is valid. It's just a matter of which one we're going to use. Here's a rule of thumb. Okay, it doesn't always work this way, but the rule of thumb is this. If you have a question uh, involving a charged particle and magnetic field, and the question refers to the radius of the path, you're almost always going to use this. Okay, not every time, but almost always. If you try that and it doesn't work, it's no big deal. Just try another one. But try that first. If the question mentions radius, try this first. So we're going to do that. We're going to say FC is equal to FM. Okay, that's our, that's our first guess here because that's the one that's going to work 98% of the time in a situation like this. We're going to say MV squared over R equals QVB. Um, we have the mass is 9.11. Actually, let's rearrange this. Solving for R. Becomes MV squared equals QVB times R. Right, the R goes up by multiplying to get it to the top. And then the QVB goes down by dividing. Hey, what do you notice about the V, though? Sorry? No? No? If the V had, it appears in both terms, we can cancel one out, right? It's a V squared on the left side. It's a V on the right side. So we can't cancel everything out. But one of the Vs on each side disappears. So it becomes MV is equal to cubed times V times R. Uh, take the QB over by dividing. MV over QB. M is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31, the mass of the electron. The speed was 4 times 10 to the 5. Charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And the magnetic field strength is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 Tesla. Uh, good question. What units would that give us, anybody? Even before we get the answer. Should be meters, right? If we're using standard units throughout the rest of the question, then we're going to get standard units for the answer. Should be meters. Um, we don't even need to do this on our calculator. Okay, there's a, there's a cheat here, a shortcut here. 1.6 times 2.5 is 4. 2 times 1.6 is 3.2. 2 and a half times 1.6 is 4. So in other words, those all disappear, right? 4 divided by 4 is 1. So now we've got an answer that's 9.11 times 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 31, 10 to the minus 26. 10 to the minus 26 divided by 10 to the minus 21 is, I believe, 10 to the 5. Is it 10 to the negative 5? That makes more sense, actually. 10 to the 5 would be a big a big radius. 10 to the minus 5 meters. Now, hold on, guys, two seconds. Don't pack up yet. Which direction will it bend, up or down? Well, if the magnetic field is into the page, the particle is moving to the right. We're going to use the hand rule for deflection. Thumb, fingers, palm points downward. We don't need to go through that hand rule five times like we did before. We know that if it bends downward, it's going to go like that. Does that make sense? Sorry? Yeah, you'd say downwards, yeah. It's not going to go straight down. It's going to bend downwards like this in a circular path, but it's going to go downwards. All right. Um, the worksheet that goes with this is number 12, but since you've got a couple bits of homework for tomorrow already, we're not going to assign that. Okay? But be prepared for that, obviously, for, for Friday, okay? Worksheet number 12 for Friday. Hey, have a good night, guys, and we'll see you guys tomorrow.